So, uh, welcome uh, everybody to the last uh, of this uh, year's uh, Shanghai lectures. Uh, needless to say, we have a very interesting program today. Uh, and uh, uh, so, after my short introduction, Rolf will do a kind of summary lecture of, of the whole series of this year. Then we will have uh, Manuel Zaveloso talking about uh, a, uh, giving a talk about uh, a concept that she introduced, which is a symbiotic autonomy, which is a, a nice, a nice idea that sometimes uh, robots could simply uh, ask for help the humans when when they don't understand uh, what they have to do or when, when they cannot push the elevator button. And then we will, we, we will have a, a final panel we, as a part of, of this uh, summary and recap of what we have seen so far, which uh, uh, will uh, be around the two main questions. The first one will be, does AI need an AI need embodiment? <laughs> yes, of, it's the answer. <laughs> of course, some things, of course. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the second will be, um, a discussion on the future of a Shanghai lecture. So this is the last one of this year. Uh, we will have another edition. We, it would be nice if we, the Shanghai lecture community, discuss together how we want uh, to proceed. There are different hypotheses, uh, and uh, we will discuss uh, them uh, uh, later today with Wei Dong Cheng for the Shanghai uh, Zhao Tong University. He's the, they are the director of the robotics lab. We also have a robotics lab here. Uh, Vincent Muller from Anatolia um, um, Technical College uh, and Oxford University. Uh, Rolf, that we know very well. Manuela Veloso, who is from Carnegie Mellon, I will introduce uh, her. Is actually currently the president of a free AI. And Vera Zapotina from the Russian School for the Huma um, Humanities uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, we, we actually, is, uh, um, together with uh, Vincent, is the other people from the humanities. So, um, welcome again, welcome everybody. Uh, I leave the floor to Rolf for, uh, for his lecture. Okay, can this, can you see this? Yes. Is it okay? Uh, right. Yes. Okay, very good. So I will try to briefly sum up some of the main ideas that have been discussed during the semester. And I basically have three main points in a sort of steps towards a theory of intelligence. I think Fabio already had a lecture on this. And I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to talk a little about this. And then I will illustrate some of the design principles and then sort of highlight a few ideas on how things can be seen differently. Okay, I'm leaving out, so it's first uh, the meta considerations or a kind of a mindset. I'm leaving out the first two, level of generality, diversity, compliance, they're a bit dry, but then frame of reference. I think that's one of the main messages. It's an extremely simple idea, and it's even more surprising because it's so simple, it's very surprising that the literature is full of you know, uh, le let's say, uh, full of text where people mess up the frame of reference problem. Uh, just uh, maybe to the audience, anyone would like to uh, briefly comment on the frame of reference problem? You know, what are the components? What is it about? I think that's the main message, or one of the main messages, very important, very simple, but very important, very powerful. Anyone? So, yeah? Does anyone volunteer? Right. 
Okay, so, yeah? Um, um, so, All right. Hi. Um, so the frame of reference problem is um, when you observe a behavior that you think that is conflict, but um, in the end it's uh, based on uh, simple rules like uh, this and uh, walking on the beach and avoiding all the objects. You would think it's such a complex behavior and so on, but it's a simple, um, simple action in the end. Exactly. Exactly. So this is maybe illustrated with, uh, can be illustrated with this uh, particular cartoon, you know, that complex behavior may actually be based on uh, very simple rules of behavior. And then we have a complexity, uh, well, that's a complexity issue. We have the observer and we have the situated perspective of the agent. And so I think we should always keep these apart. Then another sort of basic or meta consideration, so to speak, as the time perspectives. What do we mean by these time perspectives? If someone would like to volunteer. I mean, it's very basic, but I think very important. So any, yeah? So any, like, like if you talk about intelligence, I think it's it's a good idea to always look at three timescales. I mean, there are many more timescales, but I think these are the three essential ones to hear it now, which is basically how does something work? You know, it's the mechanism, the dynamical system. Then we have the ontogenetic perspective, which concerns the lifetime of an individual learning and development. So rather than designing the mechanisms here, if we talk about design, we design the initial conditions and the learning and developmental mechanisms. And then the here and now, the way it works emerges from this process. So we have emergence here. This uh, we have emergence and then we have the phylogenetic perspective, which is basically how does this all come about over many uh, generations. And so I think this idea of emergence is really a very fundamental one if we are thinking about a theory of intelligence. And so we have various types of emergence. I don't know, maybe someone would like to uh, briefly comment on different types of emergence because it's, it's really a fundamental concept. Anyone kind? So if we look at an individual, for example, puppy, I think we discussed a puppy. Uh, so it has very simple control and then there are these springy, these springs attached. I mean, only this joint here, so to speak, the hip joint is driven. The others are passive, but they're connected by springs. And so in that sense, it's an underactuated system because not all the joints are controlled or driven. But because of the springy materials, you actually get stable uh, gait patterns. And the, just by looking at the control program that actually drives these motors, you cannot predict what's actually going to happen. You have to know the material properties. So that's one type of emergence. We saw the emergence of clustering in the Swiss robots. I'll come back to this uh, in a second. And we get emergence of global patterns from local rules. That's a very important one. Look at a beehive, a termite mound, or you know a wave in a stadium. Or even uh, you could also view open source development community in this view. Or you have emergence from timescales, like in Bongard's block pushers, where the behavior, the actual here and now, the movement, the locomotion, and the pushing is emergent from an evolutionary 
perspective. Maybe we can briefly have the video now, Tan. Can I ask something? Sure, please do. Uh, it, that, that's Vincent. Uh, it, it sounds like what you're saying is the same thing from two different angles. So the emergence is fundamental for intelligence. That means that one property in a particular frame of reference uh, appears simple, as we said before, and in different frame of references it appears as intelligent, complex, and, and so this is the emergence, that it goes from one frame of reference to another one. Is that maybe intimately connected to these two things? So you said, for example, global right. patterns right. from local rules. The local rules are simple, right? right? So if you look at them from a frame of reference of the local system, then it might be really simple and uh, explain how the insect can walk, say? Right. right. And if you look at a global pattern, then? Right. And, and so I think uh, all perspectives are really important, you know, the global perspective. But I think if you can identify the local rules, the local rules of interaction, this has explanatory power. I mean, from so basically an argument from philosophy of science. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thanks for the comment. So maybe, uh, Nathan, uh, is it okay to uh, play the video? Artificial ontogeny is a system for automatically evolving virtual robots or agents in a three-dimensional physics-based simulation for various user-defined tasks. In our first set of experiments, we evolved agents to push a large block in their environment as far as possible during a fixed time period. Here we see an agent growing from a single starting sphere into a set of connected spheres. These spheres are loosely modeled on biological cells, but also serve as the basic mechanical unit from which the agent is constructed. Each unit contains a complete copy of the genetic information shaping the growth of the agent, as well as sensors, motors, and neural structure. As these units grow and divide, so too does the neural structure grow inside the developing body. The agent shown here was extracted from one evolutionary run after two hours. At this point, artificial ontogeny has discovered how to grow the brain and body of the agent together to achieve an inchworm method of locomotion. This agent is a descendant of the previous one and appeared in the evolving population after a further two hours had elapsed. Here evolution has discovered that increased mass allows the agent to exert more force against the block. Also, the inchworm method of locomotion has been modified to create a long appendage that pushes against the block. White units contain both sensors and motors. Light gray units contain only sensors. The dark gray units contain only motors, and the black units are empty and only provide structural support. The combination of different types of units within a single agent indicates that cell differentiation has occurred. A genetic algorithm based on genetic regulatory networks was designed to first grow and then evaluate each agent from among a population of potential solutions. This agent was taken from a separate evolutionary run. In this run, artificial ontogeny discovers that pushing against the block with two points of contact instead of one is a much better strategy. The appendages support one another by lying across each other. These three agents, taken together, demonstrate that genetic regulatory networks can be used to design all aspects of an autonomous agent, including the body shape and size, the material from which the agent is constructed, the numbers and distribution of sensors and motors, and the construction of neural structure, which is distributed across the agent's body. The genetic regulatory networks are necessary because they allow evolution to grow, but also to modify different parts of the agent's body at the same time. Thus, changes to one component do not disrupt the other components. Ah, okay, thank you.
So we saw that you have an evolutionary process and embedded into that evolutionary process you have ontogenetic a process of ontogenetic development and then basically you are taking back designer commitments rather than designing the mechanism for example the inchworm method of locomotion directly into the agent you just tell uh, the agent you know basically push the block and then evolution comes up with this um, method of locomotion so in that sense this inchworm method of locomotion is emergent from an evolutionary process also the size of the organism because evolution discovered that if you want to push a large block you need a certain weight another i think fa fascinating example of emergence is what i call the uh, emergent uh, bicycle these are experiments actually by uh, by shuhei miyashita and so what you have here is basically a dish with a liquid so and these are swimming tiles here so you have this triangle it's very light you know there's less than a gram and this one has a magnet and a vibration motor providing non-specific energy input and the green parts they are just discs and they only have a magnet and what I call the self-assembled emergent bicycle so it's a result of self-assembly and there's absolutely no processing going on there's no microprocessor or anything but still you do get something very useful through a process of self-organization so Nathan can we have the second video Yeah, so now he is putting the triangle into the water and switches on the vibration motor. Then the part, the triangle starts moving around on the water, swimming on the water. It's actually filmed from below with a mirror. And now he adds the two green discs, which are entirely passive. They only have a magnet. And now switching on the vibration motor of the triangle. The green discs are entirely passive. And now, for some reason, there's a disturbance. And now, sure enough, you get the bicycle. So I think that's a fascinating idea that demonstrates, really, also the power of self-organization. OK. We also talk about morphological computation. I come back to that because there is no control in that sense only morphology and materials that you have here by the way i also use this as an example to show why simulation is not enough that you actually need to build real physical systems because nobody was able to give me the simulator that would have given us this result but of course with hindsight now we can go back and improve the simulator that now uh, we can get it okay another brilliant example of self-organization or exploitation of uh, or of emergence if you like is uh, the jaeger lipson coffee balloon gripper so if you go to the supermarket and you buy ground coffee then the package is typically very hard because of the vacuum that you have in there now what they did is they took a balloon they took finely ground coffee they filled it into the balloon and then they add a vacuum pump here and then what they do is with the gripper because it's soft because it's filled with the ground coffee they go move over the object they lower the gripper and then because it's soft it adapts automatically to the shape of the object they apply a vacuum the structure hardens but doesn't change shape and so they have basically outsourced the adaptivity there, so there's no the adaptivity is not controlled centrally but it's only at the periphery through the material properties now not and do you think you could play this uh, video of the coffee balloon gripper briefly so this is a small so light bulb the big leap uh, that we've done in this project led by Heinrich Jaeger from Chicago was to uh, realize that this very fundamental process uh, now they take a different object, 
and, and I think that's that's you know that same control, was, identical was, control, was, different types I now, completely this. different object, identical like, control. Know, the different ways, what materials work best, and so forth. So you I know, think it's is, absolutely, uh, of, absolutely of brilliant. I think that's uh, probably uh, enough uh, now, Don. I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think this is a brilliant idea of how you can exploit materials. I sometimes talk about the power of materials. So not everything has to be in the brain or the control, but you can outsource a lot of important functionality uh, to the periphery of the system, to the material properties. So there is a new emerging field that I think you have talked about already extensively, and that's this field of soft robotics. Soft robotics, basically meaning literally soft to touch, but also soft movement, soft interaction, smooth interaction. And I think here are uh, some soft robots from uh, Osaka University, I think really uh, very uh, brilliant here. You can see, for example, Affetto. And it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, how realistic also his or its movements actually are. Now, what's happening if you take now morphology and materials into account in your design is that you have to understand the trade-offs. Now, often you gain efficiency when you put something into the morphology or the materials. So you put something into the materials like in the coffee balloon gripper, you gain efficiency. But typically you lose flexibility or take an insect eye. It has a particular morphology, geometry, in which the facets are arranged. Now that, for certain tasks, provides efficiency for the insect, but it loses flexibility because then for other tasks, maybe it's very good for obstacle avoidance, but then it will be not so good for following another agent. Right. So we have this trade-off between morphology material, putting something into mor morphology materials and the flexibility of the system. Now, if we have changeable morphologies, if we can change, for example, the arrangement of the facets in the eye, or if we can change the material properties, like changing the stiffness of the muscles, we can regain part of that lost flexibility while maintaining the level of efficiency. And I try to arrange this or visualize this in this, uh, in this uh, slide. We also talk about morphological computation because part of you know, what previously was in the control is now in the morphology and materials. And the way to read this is that on the left you have, or let's look at this, this is an industrial robot. It's 100% controlled by a centralized program. And it works extremely well in industrial settings. There is also a very clear separation between the robot and the control. And the more you come over here, the more of the control is actually incorporated into the morphology. Here, the Jaeger lips and coffee balloon gripper, and then the passive dynamic walker that you, that you all know. And so, here we have control which is dominant and on this side we have self-organization which is dominant and we can no longer control the things directly we can only try to control the dynamics of the system and that's why we talk about guided self-organization so now that's a completely different ball game in terms of designing systems we have to design for emergence as Luke Steele's called it. Also, it's clear that emergence is not, it's there or it's not there, but it's a continuum. You can have more or less emergence uh, in a system. Okay, maybe I, so, so uh, I, Fabio, how much, how much more time do I have? When should I finish? At 10 past 10? Okay, I can't hear anything. Uh, 10.25, so it's about half an hour from now. I have still have fun. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Now, to uh, also go back to this, this uh, mindset, we have properties 
of physically embodied agents. You can take someone like puppy, but you can take a human being, you can take any kind of robot, you can take an animal, any physical agent will have certain characteristics. I don't know, would anyone like to venture? I think we typically talked about five of them. Would anyone want to come up with some some of them? I think these are all really fundamental. You know, one of them is, for example, that they're all subject to the laws of physics. I mean, just ignoring that you're, you know, basically jumping from somewhere, ignoring that there is gravity, you know, will be a silly thing to do. So we're all physical systems. And then there is another characteristic which I think is extremely fundamental for any uh, embodied system, and that is we are permanently physically influencing the environment. So basically when I'm talking, I'm putting pressure waves, physical pressure waves into the environment. Uh, when I'm walking, I'm also over the grass, you know, I crush the grass underfoot. And very important for any intelligent system is that every action, in contrast to computers, humans act continuously. And every action has as a consequence patterns of sensory stimulation. So when I walk, the environment travels across the visual field. And that's because I walk, because I physically interact with the environment. I can also sense the forces in the joints, the muscles, and I can feel the pressure on the bottom of the feet. Or when I grasp an object, like this cup, for example, I not only hold the cup in my hand, but I can also feel it and so through my physical action of grasping, I am generating patterns of sensory stimulation in the hand and on the fingertips. Right, we're also complex dynamical systems, you know, with attractor states, you know, like the gait patterns in puppy. And uh, we perform continuously perform morphological computation. Right, so I think this is very fundamental to understand any intelligent system in the real world. <laughs> and then we talked about the characteristics of the real world in contrast to virtual worlds, you know, the virtual world being, for example, the game of chess or a mathematical formalism. We have characteristics of the real world and it is important that we understand them. Uh, maybe I just quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just quickly go through them. Information acquisition always takes time. No matter how fast you're sensing systems, it does take time as soon as it's in the physical world. Information is always limited. You always, always, and this is, you know, 100%, you have noise and malfunction. There are no systems with no noise. You have no clearly defined states. Systems in the real world always have to do multiple tasks. It's not like a program that plays chess that only does one thing. You have to move, you have to, uh, you know, you have perceptual tasks, you have to feed, you have to get energy supply or charge your batteries if you're a robot. So you always have multiple tasks. You have rapid changes, you always have time pressure. And, of course, the real world, it's, it's always nonlinear. There is a high level of uncertainty. And this is why Herbert Simon coined this concept of bounded rationality. So basically, about the real world, your information is always limited. So your decisions can never be 100% rational, whatever that would really mean. OK, so this was, was about this mindset, these meta considerations. And what I would like to do now is uh, go on to discuss a few of these design principles. I think they nicely summarize some of the powerful ideas that we have been discussing on their agent design principles. There are developmental design principles according to the time scales. There are evolutionary design principles. I'll come back to some of them. And we have design principles for collective uh, intelligence. OK, let me just select a few design principles that I think are particularly interesting. 
One is the principle of parallel loosely coupled processes. It sort of goes back a bit, I mean, Rodney Brooks with his subsumption architecture that you're all familiar with basically uh, outlined this as a design, pre important design principle for intelligent systems. Now, Holt Kruse, a German biologist, very brilliant thinker, he found, I mean, it has been known for quite some time that in uh, for leg coordination in insect walking, there is not a central instance in the brain that is responsible for this communication. Now, if you look, here is a schematic of the wiring, the neural wiring. So here you have the legs and then you have the neural connections. But there is no sort of center that would control all these uh, neural. So basically, these circles are the neural circuitry for moving the legs, you know, for performing this kind of movement. Sometimes these are also called central pattern generators. And then <clears throat> you only have communication between the legs, but you don't have a center. But the, what, what Kruse, whole Kruse pointed out is that you do have global communication, but it's through the interaction it's through the interaction with the environment. So if you imagine that the insect is standing on the ground and it's pushing back with one leg, then the joints in all the other legs are changed. The joint angles are changed in all the other legs and they move in the right direction. And that's because it's an embodied system. So through the physical embodiment, this one leg movement will influence all the uh, joints in the other legs and then because they're moving in the right direction all you need to do is reinforce uh, these movements in the other leg so you can come up with much simpler neural circuits so this is coupling loose it's called loosely coupled because it's through the interaction with the environment another idea of loosely coupled uh, processes another example would be coupling through pheromone trails also through the environment but a completely different mechanism this time so instead of directly interacting or you know sort of going exploring the environment going to the nest measuring the distance comparing distances you just deposit a pheromone trail and the ants just follow the highest concentration of the pheromone trail and then they find the shortest path to a food source Now, as I already mentioned, we as human beings, in contrast to computers, continuously act. And every action has, as a consequence, patterns of sensory stimulation. Now, uh, we built, among other things, this robot here, Roboy, to study processes of well, we also call this information self-structuring because we interact with the environment, we generate patterns of sensory stimulation, and it can be shown that there are, in fact, correlations in the different sensory channels. So there is this is what we call information structure. And if the process is sen sensory motor coordinated, like, in, for example, in grasping, that's basically the sensing is continuously influencing the motor action and the motor action is continuously influencing the sensing. So that's what we call sensory motor coupling or sensory motor coordination. Uh, then we induce information structure correlations in the different sensory channels. Okay? Now I try to summarize the story here. This is extremely fundamental for any physically embodied system for any intelligent system. So one of the big problems in machine learning is the huge search spaces. And so how do you want to explore your search space? Now if you have an embodied system like a human being, you have a particular anatomy, you have properties of the muscle tendon system, the ligaments, the tissue, and so what we do is, you know, maybe I can actually show that if I, if I let my arm swing like that. This is a movement that requires very little control. It's very energy efficient. And uh, so it's very easy to do. 
is much easier to do than a movement like that. You know, that's much harder. So you can say, well, that's nice. And by the way, if you look at what the hand is doing, it's moving in a very complex way in 3D space. So again, we have a phenomenon, simple control, complex movement. Now you can say, of course, well, that's very nice. But what is it good for? Well, you can imagine if you perform this movement, if the hand by chance encounters an object, the most natural thing to do is actually to grasp the object, right? No, you don't grasp it like that. But there is an evolutionary predisposition that the palm of the right hand is facing left. So this is, this is the most natural thing to do, right? What also happens if you do this is you not only hold the cup, but you generate patterns of sensory stimulation in the hand. You also bring the cup into the center of the visual field. So you generate visual sensory stimulation in the visual channel. And I can also sense roughly how heavy the cup is. So I'm generating proprioceptive sensory stimulation. I have three sensory channels, well, there are more, but three sensory channels. And now, because there, there are uh, correlations in the sensory channels, I can start making prediction. I can learn just by looking at the cup what it will feel like when I actually grasp it. That's big. And these predictions are extremely important for our motor control. And these patterns of sensory stimulation that are generated in this way are the raw material for the brain to process and to learn something about the environment, so to speak. And because there is information structure, it's sort of good raw material. So I can form these cross-modal associations, which the developmental biologists and developmental psychologists tell us are extremely important for concept learning, these cross-modal associations. And, uh, you know, we can basically extract this mutual information which is contained in the different sensory channel. And this is also fundamental for uh, categorization. And, of course, categorization, meaning the ability to make distinctions in the real world, is very fundamental for any system that has to survive in the real world. You have to be able to uh, distinguish food from non-food, poisonous stuff, enemies, you know, conspecifics, and so on. All right. Let me go to another principle which is extremely important and powerful. It's the principle of cheap design, which is basically about the exploitation of physical properties of the agent and of the ecological niche. So, I think what we're doing here is you have these styrofoam cubes. I think you know the example, you know, the Swiss robots. And then you have a very simple, so basically the question is, you know, you get this clustering behavior. So the question is, how do you get the clustering? And it turns out that there's a very simple rule. If there is sensory stimulation on the left, turn right. If there is sensory stimulation on the right, turn left. So basically, they are programmed for obstacle avoidance, but because of the constraints that you have in the ecological niche, and because of the way here the sensors are arranged, as you can see in the lower right corner, if the robot encounters a cube head-on, this sensor is not stimulated, this sensor is not stimulated, so what will happen is that will actually push the block, right? until there is a block on the side and then it turns away and then you have two blocks. There, I think you looked at that. Now, again, here, if you're, you're exploiting conditions in the environment, that makes it very efficient for the robot or for any intelligent agent, but the big trade-off is you lose flexibility. If you take away the borders, the boards that you have at the edge of the arena, it's not going to work. The robots are just going to move off. If you change the shape, you know, for example, the uh, shape of the styrofoam cubes, you make them very small, it's not going to work anymore. You make them too big, it doesn't work anymore. If you take con concrete instead of styrofoam, it's not going to work. 
uh, you know, you will have too much friction, and so on and so forth. So many conditions have to hold. If they do hold, it's very efficient. If they don't hold, you are no longer adaptive, right? So there are these trade-offs that we need to understand, understanding the trade-offs. A very important principle that's probably one of the most fundamental principles for any kind of intelligent natural systems in the real world is the redundancy principle. Now, what do we mean by redundancy? Maybe someone can uh, volunteer from the audience. What do we mean by redundancy? Very fundamental concept. And uh, maybe you can give an example of redundancy. Anyone? Yeah? yeah. Do we have someone volunteering? What is what do we mean by redundancy? I mean it's it's very important for computer science. Can someone, you know, maybe there are computer scientists in the audience, could someone give an example from computer science where you actually uh, use the concept of redundancy? Think about communication, transferring information over a network, for example. That we have a volunteer, yeah. Okay, hello. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, one example, for example, is uh, when you use a computer, maybe you have a base of data, uh, maybe some, uh, some information, you use a redundancy, or maybe it's a copy of the information is translated to other sites. For example, right. if it says a so one problem, you can get the other information that you copy for the principal. Yes. Uh, so making a copy is, of course, a very uh, important way in which you can achieve a certain redundancy. You lose some of the information you still have to copy that you can you know you may you do make a backup a backup is a very simple example of where you actually I introduce a redundancy into the system a parity bit would something would be something or if you have if you take an airplane cockpit you would always have instead of just having one computer you would have two so in case one ceases to function you still have the other one now that's i think uh, in, an interesting way now in biological systems you have a more interesting kind of redundancy because in biological systems you never have an exact copy. And for example, you take the two eyes. It's not an exact, the information that you get from the different eyes is not exactly the same, but it's slightly different, you know, which is, which is important. Also, if you, for example, you know, take the visual system. We have two eyes. We could increase the level of redundancy by having a hundred eyes. Wouldn't it be great to have a hundred eyes instead of just two, right? Now, so you have a lot of redundancy and, you know, if 50 eyes cease to function, you still have the other 50. Great. Now, what if all of a sudden it gets dark, completely dark? Now, your additional 98 eyes are going to be totally useless just like the first two, if it's completely dark. However, you can still move because you can, for example, use your haptic sensing, your touch sensing on the hands. You know, you can still sort of move in the dark, maybe not as efficiently, but you can still move. Now, what's important about this is that you are using a different physical process. Haptics is based on mechanical touch whereas vision is based on electromagnetic waves. And this kind of redundancy is extremely important. Also, you can use, I mean, and blind people use that a lot, that they use acoustic signals to orient in space and get spatial information from the environment. So that's the kind of uh, interesting redundancy. And if you look at this example, this is a jet plane or a plane, you have the interesting kinds of redundancy. So you can break, in an airplane, you can break through the wheels on the runway. Now, if there is ice on the runway, 
you know, having additional wheels with brakes doesn't help you, but you can brake or at least support the braking process through the jet engines and the jet engines don't care whether there is ice on the runway or not. And also they can use mechanically, they can use parachute chutes. I mean, some of the, uh, at least military airplane, they have these uh, parachutes. And what's interesting is that these are different physical processes. And that's good redundancy, biological redundancy, not merely copying stuff. Principle of ecological balance. There are two aspects to this. One is that there is a match in complexity. If you look at biological system, there is a match in complexity between sensory, motor, and processing systems and neural systems. This is a beautiful example by Richard Dawkins, uh, a very outspoken biologist, also very outspoken against the intelligent design community. And he has this cartoon, he said, well, what happens if you equip a snail with eyes the size of human eyes? Well, maybe the snail will be able to detect predators approaching, you know, like a bird or something. But what good are these eyes going to be for the snail? First of all, I don't think it could even detect uh, the bird because it doesn't have the neural processing power that it would need and then it doesn't have the motor system you know so it could, even if it could detect the bird it couldn't escape so it all it does it adds weight and it adds uh, energy expenditure and is totally useless this is a ecologically non-balanced system okay there is also this task distribution between morphology materials and control and so in puppy we saw the springs some of the task is outsourced to the springs or in the robot frog we have the pneumatic actuators that take over the let's say a coping with impact on when the frog is landing from jumping okay so these were some agent design principles to select it oh i have to speed up i will speed up then there are design principles for development I won't go through them in detail, just to remind you, uh, it's a really important problem called Bernstein's problem, which is how do you learn in a system with very many degrees of freedom like the human body? And what Bernstein was suggesting as a solution is that we don't initially don't use all the degrees of freedom, but we freeze some of the degrees of freedom. So we have a lower dimensional system. And then we learn, for example, when you reach for an object, you don't need all the degrees of freedom of the body. I mean, you don't need to do this when you reach, but you just need very few degrees of freedom. And when this is movement is in place, then you can free up some of the degrees of freedom. And so basically what he is suggesting, generally speaking, is that the morphology is initially changed, namely reducing the degrees of freedom. Okay, let me skip this. We have design principles for evolution. And I think we looked at that in the context of emergence. And here is just the basic cycle that I think everyone is familiar with. So we have the genotype, we have a process of development, we get the phenotype and then we have a process of selection and then we have mutation crossover and we get a new population and the whole thing continues and this is what Dawkins, Richard Dawkins called cumulative selection and this is how ultimately you get something sophisticated or at least we believe sophisticated as a human being. Now what's very important in uh, oops, what's very important in evolution is brain-body co-evolution. Now, what most people do in robotics is they take in evolutionary robotics, they take a robot, given robot, and then they evolve the control for it. Well, there is no such thing in nature. In nature, you always have a co-evolution of the physical system, the body, and the neural system. And in these approaches, Carl Sims's creatures. Uh, the Bongards, block pushers, 
and Lipson's Lipson's uh, Golem project, you have a co-evolution of the neural of the brain and the body, so to speak. And what uh, George Bongard is doing, I think, is very interesting. Is he is using a genetic regulatory network to control the developmental process. So rather than encoding the structure or the traits of the organism of the phenotype, like the color of the eye or the length of the limbs, the, the body weight into the genome, he encodes the parameters of the genetic regulatory network. Okay, let me let me speed up here a little. So he ends up with a genetic regulatory network, which is depicted here. Okay, now just to finish off things, uh, what I also uh, try to do with these uh, with these lectures is to show to demonstrate that things can be seen differently. We always have our prejudices. Okay, now let me just go through this qu quickly. Uh, you are already familiar with this. The Swiss robots, rather than you know, if you have to collect cubes, basically what you have to do is you look for a cube if possibly the nearest one, you pick up the cube, you look for the nearest cluster, you go to the cluster, you deposit the cube. But we know that, as we saw before, with this simple rule that you see here, it works. Right, so it's a completely different way of looking at it. We can walk without control, as in the passive dynamic walker, there is only structure, there's no sensor, no microprocessor, uh, there is no uh, a motor, purely passive, you can walk by exploiting morphology, so this is a lot of morphological computation. You can get rapid locomotion with slow electronics or brains by outsourcing functionality to the material properties, for example, to the springs, and we, you know, this is morphological computation, we get a phenomenon of self-stabilization. You get leg coordination without central control, as we saw, we normally think, well, how is that possible? Should be coordinated up here? No, it's not necessary. Social competence without cognition, high-level cognition. So this is Cynthia Brazil with her, with her uh, robot that she built a long time ago at MIT. I think it's, it's really nice. And maybe we can briefly have the video, just the first I like your part of it. You're a pretty funny person. Now that's do you laugh at all? I laugh a lot. Carol says I laugh a lot. I try not to laugh at her. <laughs> okay. You're adorable. Who are you? What are you? Mm -hmm. I want to show you something. This is, this is a watch that my... This is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Oh, hell. Yeah, look, it's got a little... Blue okay, blue. I think... Yeah. Now, I think that's probably enough. Thing. Now, what's interesting about this is, I mean, uh, Cynthia wouldn't probably not agree with me, but we have a couple of reflexes. One is turning towards the sound. You know, when you hear a loud sound, we do all that. We turn towards moving objects. We track slowly moving objects. And that's a reflex, and we have a habituation mechanism, so we get we get bored, and then we try to do something else. So when you talk to Ro Rodney Brooks, you know, I said, well, it's really interesting. So this is as if Kismet had some social competence. So imagine Kismet, so a person is coming in the door, you're talking to Kismet. Kismet will reflex, like, turn towards the sound. Then the person comes into the room, will follow with the eyes, uh, the person, and then through habituation, or the other person starts talking again, it will turn back to the other person, which is exactly what we expect, the behavior we expect from a socially competent person. So, this is as if Kismet had social competence from reflexes, and I asked Ronnie Brooks, and he said, well, this, he said, what do you mean as if this is social competence? So maybe social behavior through simple reflexes, that's an open question, but I think probably a lot more than we would like to believe is based on simple reflexes and not driven by our high-level intelligence or cognition. And the psychologist John Bark at Yale University wrote a beautiful paper uh, <clears throat> more than a decade ago 
entitled the unbearable automaticity of being, where he basically identifies processes like that. Okay, we already had that, finding the shortest path without measuring, storing, comparing. And then <coughs> there is a myth. Computers can never be creative. They can only reproduce what you program into them. Well, I would say don't overestimate yourselves. Here is a scene from iRobot. Some of you may remember, and then the human says to the robot, but a robot could never write a symphony like Beethoven. And then the robot said, could you? Well, I think my, I, I certainly couldn't. You know. But evolution, for example, comes up with creative solutions like Reckenberg's hunched fuel pipe. I think you talked about that. Or the antennas used by NASA on their satellites have been designed by computer programs, by genetic algorithms, so and, and, you know, better antennas than engineers could have designed. So creative or not, I don't care, but it functions better. It's definitely a provocation to our own creativity. Let me skip this. So I'm coming to the end. I found in this book by uh, David Payne that some of you may know, um, it's called um, Confessions of a Taoist on Wall Street. And the story goes like that. I think it beautifully summarizes what I try to uh, say in my lecture now. So Sunni is the son of a Chinese mother and, uh, mother and an American fighter pilot. Mother dies at birth, his father returns to the US, so Sunni is left alone and grows up in a monastery and Wu, the chef, is his mentor. So one of the chores was carrying water in buckets from the river to the monastery, which was situated on a high rock. When they arrived at the top, Sunni's buckets were always empty. Wu's always full. Now listen to the following conversation. This is the illustration. You have Wu and you have Sunni. So it was true, by some extraordinary luck or skill, Wu never seemed to lose a drop. Though he hurried along the treacherous stair at twice my pace, I tried to cut my losses by moving slowly, putting my course in advance and picking each foot dressed with deliberate care. I don't understand it, I confess to him. You must know some kind of trick. Explain your method. You haven't caught on. It's precisely this excess of method that confounds you, leaves the buckets nearly empty. If you're so smart, how do you do it then? Well, how do I do it? I close my eyes and think of nothing. My mind is somewhere else. My legs find their way without me, even over the most uneven ground. How can I tell you how I do it? I can't even remember myself. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.